Hello, Burbies. Welcome to my news recap of the day. Check out the articles that I have found for you. Let me know which ones stood out for you the most. Make sure you give me a comment. Enjoy. So this was a story that I saw this past week. FGM ban in Gambia under threat as cause to repeal law. Women's rights campaigners denounce hugely regressive proposals from political and religious leaders to decriminalize the practice of FGM. So women just got these rights and just sought these protections for girls and women in their country. And now the political leaders and the religious leaders want to roll back the gains of women to help provide safety um, for women and girls. That just reminds us all that religious leaders and political leaders work hand in hand and they are typically XYs that are not looking out for women and girls. Just keep that in mind. Let's get into this article. Political and religious leaders in the Gambia are threatening to introduce a bill to decriminalize FGM eight years after the practice was outlawed. Members of the country's National Assembly have backed a proposal for the 2015 law to be scrapped, while the Supreme Islamic Council has issued a fatwa condemning anyone who denounces the practice and calling for the government to reconsider the legislation. Activists and civil society organizations said the movement would be hugely regressive. The Gambia took a bold step in 2015 towards eradicating FGM. So for us to go back after eight years and start again would have very, very big implications for the country, said Falu Sowi, national coordinator of the civil society organization Network Against Gender-Based Violence. Almost three quarters of women, 73% aged 15 to 49, have undergone FGM, according to the country's demographic health survey um, from 2019 to 2020, and almost two-thirds were cut before they were five. FGM involves the partial or total removal of the female body parts, um, which can have serious long-term health consequences, including infertility. The practice is considered a violation of women's and girls' human rights, and in 2012, the UN passed a resolution to ban it. FGM is still practiced in about 30 countries in Africa and the Middle East. The procedure is usually performed by female cutters for cultural and religious reasons. In some communities, it is a prerequisite for marriage. Under the current law in Gambia, a person convicted of performing FGM faces up to three years in prison, a fine of 50,000 delasi, or both, where FGM leads to death. The perpetrator could face life imprisonment. Debate began in late August after three women were convicted of FGM in the central region, Central River region, the first prosecution under the 2015 law in order to pay a fine of 15,000 delasi or spend a year in jail. A few days later, an Islamic cleric paid the fines, and encouraged Gambians to continue the practice of FGM. The, if, the issue was debated at the National Assembly in September, where there were calls to repeal the law. Fatou Balde, a, a survivor of FGM and the founder of Women in Liberation and Leadership, a Gambian civil society organization, said she was already seeing the impact. In the past couple of weeks, she and her team have been chased out of three communities by accusing them of challenging our cultures, norms, and religion. We have broken the culture of silence on FGM. We've moved backwards. A huge damage has already been done because of these statements issued by the Islamic Supreme Council saying FGM is Islamic. Balde um, fears that if the law on FGM is repealed, other laws protecting women and girls, such as one forbidding marriage under 18, may be targeted. So what you see here pictured, um, ex-practitioners of FGM take part in the dropping of the, the tools of the trade ceremony in the Gambia. Just looking at this, I just cannot fathom what the women and girls have to go through, how scared the girls are when they are going through this, the fear that goes through them, all because these people, these Islamic leaders, these politicians want to 
push this as culture, as religion, as saying that women and girls don't deserve to have our bodies intact. It, it's just challenging. Um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, Balde goes on to say, the impact will be felt in the wider region, she added. Other countries might use this tragic experience as a way to challenge their countries uh, not to pass laws that protect women and continue these harmful traditional practices. In neighboring Sierra Leone, what 83% of women aged 15 to 49 have undergone FGM, the Institute for Human Rights and Development in Africa, and a coalition of 26 feminist movement organizations recently filed two legal cases against the government to compel ministers to enact a law. Mama Juby, who used to cut the girls in her community in the Gambia's Central River region, stopped practicing in 2021 when she discovered it was not a religious obligation. I know it is not Islam. Not all Islamic scholars accept this as a religious practice. If anybody feels sympathy for their fellow human beings, they need to stop. It is painful. I will keep telling others about the consequences of this practice. I've abandoned it and I've abandoned it and will never tell anybody to practice it. So that is where we are right now. Women who are, no, this is a reason why people in these countries seek to keep women and girls from being educated because, and you know, I am not, I'm not Muslim. I do not read the, the Quran, their holy book, but people keep saying that this is not Islamic. And I don't know for sure because I am not, but if this is not in their holy books that they need to cut girls, why are they doing it? They are able to get away with it because the men in charge, the men in charge tell women that this is part of their traditions, their cultures, their religion. And since the women and girls are not reading this for themselves, they are just going along to get along. And the women are the upholders of the culture because they are the ones that are doing the practice. But Let's be real. We all know that in these countries, if women don't just go along with it, their lives could also be in danger. If they don't follow cultural norms, it's not just the shaming. It is the threat of violence for not staying in line. So women, we have got to, you know, I am on the outside looking in. I can read about this. I can watch other creators create stories about this, but we need to keep this in the public discourse because this is a humanitarian crisis of, for women and girls. Just because it's not happening on our um, soil doesn't mean that we shouldn't care what <laughs> they're talking about. 75% in one country, 83% in another country have been, have undergone FGM. This, this, is unfathomable, but we need to continue to speak on this, share the stories, do what we can. This is what I can do as a content creator, and then ask you to share the stories with somebody. Like, comment, share. So I saw this article in Forbes, and I thought it was interesting to bring here. The labor shortage is here for one reason, and it's quiet quitting. To the question, where are all the workers? New research has an answer, they're improving their work-life balance. This country is in a shift. It's palpable. You can see it happening. We are literally watching the revolution. One question has hovered over the post-pandemic economy for the better part of three years. Where are all the workers? Businesses' difficulty hiring has been blamed on a gamut of ills. Too generous unemployment benefits, too many stimulus checks, not enough immigration, too many workers with long COVID, and finally, simple laziness. So how about this answer? The workers are still there. They're just not working as hard. So the researchers found that, that these people are still employed. They're just working fewer hours. Okay, so the part that's cut off, it says, it's not that fewer people are willing to work. If anything, more people are willing to work than before the pandemic. It's just that some people are cutting back their hours. So if you look at this graph, um, the part that's cut off at the bottom, these are for the years 2021, 20, I mean, 2020, 2021, 22, 23. So you see the huge drop at the bottom and then it starts to climb 
up to 83% as far as getting back on the job. And these are the people that are participating in the labor force. So it dropped pretty dramatically and then it's starting to climb up. So you can see the you can see the graph with the numbers a little bit better. This is the labor force participation rate for prime age workers. So it is now higher than it was pre pandemic. So Shannon, his co-authors, Ph.D. candidates, Dane Lee and Jihuk Park found that 80 found that 55 percent of the drop in labor supply since the pandemic was due to a decline in hours, while the rest came from people dropping dropping out of the labor force. And it's not early retirees who are cutting back either. Most of the reduction came from highly educated men working intensive jobs of 50 hours a week or more. It's actually young people, 25 to 45, who used to work very long hours who are now cutting back. It's all men, not women. This part was, that part was very surprising to me. So I am going to read it again. Most of the reduction came from highly educated men working intensive jobs of 50 hours a week or more. It's actually young people, 25 to 45, who used to work very long hours who are now cutting back. It's all men, not women. Why quitting and no work Fridays? The data helps explain why, even with the labor participation rate near its pre-pandemic level, job openings remain near record highs and hundreds of thousands more jobs are created every month. Meanwhile, the unemployment rate is a mere 3.8 percent, a rate that was considered unbelievably low a few short years ago. Shin believes the pandemic, which pushed millions of Americans to reevaluate what was important to them in life, also set off an epidemic of quiet quitting, perhaps better described as salary workers declining to work excessive hours. Wow. So they're not working all of these hours and they're just quitting. They're just not quitting. They're quitting on time. Not everybody wants to keep hustling so much. Hustle culture has gone the way of the dodo bird, it seems. Everyone reevaluated their work-life balance, and maybe they said, I don't have to work 55 hours. I like to spend more time with my family. In other words, quiet quitting, which has previously been blamed for costing the global economy billions. He also successfully supported the tightest, I'm sorry, has also successfully supported the tightest job market in a generation and an increasingly emboldened workforce. That is the workforce that we're seeing where these people um, in these different industries keep striking because they are asking for more money for what they do and better working conditions. So this graph shows the number of job openings versus the number of unemployed job seekers. And you could see that the number of job openings, which is the red line, is quite, a. there is a big old chunk versus the people that are actually looking for jobs. So this gap is big. That's 3 million people. I mean, 3 million jobs that are going unfilled. And I don't know where, how they're going to fill this. So there's going to be a continued job, um, a now hiring sign everywhere. But also we have got to remember that many of these jobs simply do not want to pay the employees. They keep paying the, the C-suite people, the higher ups, but they're not paying. They don't want to pay the employees. So this is going to be an ongoing situation. And people that live here, y'all, we're going to have to expect there's going to be delays. There's going to be service crunches. There's going to be, I mean, the quality is probably not going to be there because these jobs are going un, unfilled. Crucially, while many of these quiet quitters may have wished for less work pre-pandemic, the advent of hybrid or remote work in white collar fields has given them the leeway to make it a reality. Even in some offices that are calling back their workforces, No Work Fridays has become a phenomenon with empty offices, few meetings, and significantly fewer emails, something Shin and his, I mean, something Shin said he's seen among even his own friends. Say you've done all your work for Friday in the morning and you know your colleagues are not in front of the computer either. This allows people to shift back a little bit and not work when the work is not there. Less frequently, the cutback in work comes from above as when Shopify earlier this year eliminated unnecessary meetings from its workers' calendars. No one schedules meetings for a Friday afternoon or hardly any Friday at all. We all agree, let's get everything done by early afternoon. 
See, that, that makes sense. Well, let's start listening to people. Plenty of corporations are now trying to claw back some of their workers' newfound free time, whether it's mandating three days three days a week in the office, rewarding workers who put in more face time, or simply t- telling adamant remote workers you can just go elsewhere, as Amazon CEO Andy Jesse memorably did this summer. But if the new normal is hybrid work, Shin Shin is hopeful that white collar employees won't go back to their overworked ways. He doesn't see the trend as shirking, but as a realignment of people's work days with the vagaries of knowledge jobs. Sometimes you just sitting in your office for um, for no obvious reason is like it's not like a production line where the workflow is constant. I like that that idea of a realignment because our I do believe that we're shifting and you're seeing this in many different ways where people are just saying no more to the excessive demands without being paid for it. People that have been undervalued and underpaid are saying, "No, I know my worth. You're going to pay me and you're going to you're going to comply with some of my demands." And I love it. I don't know if everybody is not striking. Everybody in every industry is not striking. But some of this is like a strike of one where they're like, no, I will just opt out and go find something else. And the market will have to adjust. Employers will have to adjust. You guys go ahead and jump in the comments and let me know what you think of this trend. Like, comment, share. Are y'all tired of these book bans? I know that I am. Acting like book bans are really what is saving children versus actually putting protocols in place to care and save children. Anyways, this newest article coming out of Alabama, the newest news, education superintendent mandates book challenge policies at Alabama school libraries. Let's see what's going on with this. State education superintendent, Dr. Eric Mackey, sent a memo last week to local Alabama school superintendents to ensure they have a book reconsideration policy in place at their libraries. This comes after only one book was challenged and removed from a school library in 2022 because it's unnecessary. I am sure that the school librarians are actually vetting books. Every local board of education should have an approved written policy that guides the selection, deselection, and reconsideration of library resources. This policy should be reviewed and revised on a regular basis and be familiar to all school administrators and school library staff. While public libraries have been the center of debate about appropriate books for children, Alabama school libraries have mainly remained unchallenged because it's silly good for them for remaining unchallenged. School libraries are not public libraries and serve a specific targeted audience that includes mostly juvenile users. The nuance of school libraries makes it even more important for educators to ensure that the materials available are age and developmentally appropriate and that parents and guardians understand the mission and role of school libraries in their collections. Mackey said there should be a straightforward procedure for handling complaints and for reconsidering challenged materials that should be clearly defined and communicated in the policy and be applicable to anyone. He said there should be an added appeal process to the local board of education if a book is challenged or if or someone wants to retain a book. At Thursday's state board of education work session, Dr. Mackey brought up the memo and he said he talked to the superintendents about the importance of having a challenge policy in place. I am happy that there is actually some some wisdom or an adult in the conversation as far as this goes, because the other things that I have seen have been silly regarding these book bannings. Belinda McRae, a Republican representing District 7, spoke up during the meeting and said she'd spoken with an elementary school librarian in her district who received books considered inappropriate as samples from book companies. The librarian had to change her method of handling books. Now I sit down and I read every book before I put it out and I make the determination whether or not this would be accepted in this community. Isn't that what librarians would typically do? Dr. Mackey was unavailable for additional comment at the time of publication. What that Republican person, Belinda McRae said, 
she's giving the actual job description of a librarian. Isn't a librarian supposed to read? The staff is supposed to read and vet. What I do not believe is happening. These people that are creating these challenges, I do not believe that they are reading or rank very high in education if they are reading. Because let's be effing for real, our states are typically low, lower, lower ranked where it comes to education. So I do not believe that they have the bandwidth to actually read these books, even the elementary school books, and put forth a proper challenge. That makes sense. But that is me saying that. And I do not believe that these people are actually looking out for the best interests of um, school children. That is me. You guys can go ahead and comment and let me know your thoughts on book bannings. Like, comment, share.